watching Good Morning Britain. Now, Shamima Begum will today find out if she can come back to the UK. A court is deciding today if she has won her appeal against the government's decision to strip her of British citizenship. Shamima fled from Britain aged 15 with two other girls and went into Syrian territory controlled by Islamic State. In 2021, she spoke to us directly from the camp she was living in then. The reason I came to ISIS, to Syria, was not for any violent reasons, not because I wanted to be a terrorist. It was because I thought I was doing the right thing as a Muslim and I, was, I, I did not want to hurt anyone, you know, in Syria or anywhere else in the world. The hearing is centred on whether she was a victim of trafficking or a committed extremist and therefore a threat to the UK, which is why her citizenship was mm. removed. So will she be allowed to return by the courts today? Former Chief Superintendent Dal Babu believes the ruling won't be the end of the case, whatever the outcome. Former senior military intelligence officer Philip Ingram doesn't think Shamima Begum should be allowed to come back. And we're also joined by Jonathan Hall, the independent reviewer of terrorism legislation. Can I just start with you, Jonathan, as the, um, you know, a, um, a Casey, very experienced lawyer, an expert in these matters, just to understand, if um, Shamima wins the appeal today, is that the end of the story? Or will there be further legal um, uh, cases to come? Will there be a further appeal? And yeah. if she were to return to the UK as a British citizen... Does that mean that she is then free or will she then be prosecuted in the UK as a UK citizen for potentially the offences that um, she has committed, including um, exclu um, excusing or, um, or glorifying the Manchester bombing? Yeah, it, it, this, is, this is stage one. So if she won her appeal and she was her citizenship was restored, that doesn't mean that she could come out of the camp because the position of the UK government has been that even British citizens, they can't come out of the camp unless the government is prepared to help them, what lawyers call give them consular assistance. And there have been quite a few cases, actually, where British citizens who've never been deprived have been asking to leave and the government has said, no, we're not prepared to give you the help to leave. So this is stage one. The next question is, would they allow would they give her assistance to leave? And the, the current position of the government is, I suspect, no. But let's imagine that she did somehow manage to get back to the UK. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that prosecution is not, if you like, the first line of defence in terms of managing any risk. It's really hard in the UK system because we have conspicuously fair trials. Our laws weren't really adapted to deal with people like Shamima Begum. So it's possible that she could be prosecuted for some of the things that she said on television, some of the things that she said to you. But I think that um, within, in the main, it's unlikely that, that many people are going to be prosecuted. And then if she couldn't be prosecuted, in principle, there are some civil orders that could be made. So there's an order called a temporary exclusion order, which would require her to come back on a particular plane, uh, require her when she'd come back to report to the authorities and to register her address. So there are some ways of managing the risk. And no doubt there'd also be other sort of monitoring in the background yeah. as well. I mean, Jonathan, you know, we're, before we go into the nitty gritty of, of that detail, which kind of is sometimes a bit overwhelming for people to yeah. take in, you're in this deep today. I suppose the legal situation and the fear might be for the government that if they bring her back and she does face prosecution and for whatever reason, mm doesn't get convicted, that feels like a nerve-wracking position for those that are convinced that she did wrong by being there, whatever her age, um, and that means that it would be a very bad example. But what would, needs to be done legally yeah. otherwise? Can she just be left there? I, I agree. I mean, there are two things on there. I mean, personally, my blood boils about what people did when they joined Islamic State. So there is a genuine need for accountability. Again, we haven't got a great record of this. The Germans and the Swedes are very good at, for example, prosecuting people for war crimes. So even if you can't prosecute someone for being involved in terrorism, were they involved in mistreating Yazidi people, for example? Were they occupying the houses of people who they'd thrown out during the conquest? So there's the accountability piece, then there's the risk piece. Um, but I think you, you do need to look at Shamu Begum's case in a wider context, which is whatever happens in her case, 
a lot of European countries are now bringing back people. The Americans are putting a huge amount of pressure to try and bring these camps to an end on the basis that they are just going to incubate the next version of Islamic State. And you know, the Germans have brought back about 100, the French have brought back well over 100. And increasingly, there's going to be pressure on the UK to do the same. So I think the answer is you've got to watch this space. You will find more and more pressure, not mm -hmm. simply on the basis of humanitarian concerns. And there are children there who are in you know, an appalling position and they are completely blameless. But also because as a matter of the real politique, the UK is going to have to start taking its share, I suspect. So there are some really tricky decisions coming down the line for the government. Dal, you know the family. You uh, have worked with them closely. Um, there's a wider implication for all society, but you're looking at this, in a sense, as an individual, aren't you? You're looking at it at an individual girl, from, that's what the family feel it is, who made some mistakes at 15, who now regrets them and is fundamentally a British citizen, albeit she's had that stripped. Do you think there is enough public sympathy? Because we've had lots of comments this morning, and most of them, got to be honest, very negative, don't bring her back. How did that change, in your view, the, the position that people have on her? Well, it's going to be very, very difficult. And I think Jonathan gave a, an excellent summary there of, of where we are and the complexity of this situation. We, ha we have to remember that she was 19 when she was interviewed. Mm. She said some very foolish things. But this was particularly about the bombing of the Manchester mm, Arena. Absolutely, yeah. And that was a very, very foolish thing to say, to, to liken the Manchester Arena atrocity. She said she could understand the justification yeah. for it, just yeah. to be really yeah. clear, didn't yeah. she, when absolutely. she was 19? Yeah. yeah. And, and, uh, and all of us would have been shocked that somebody mm. was prepared to say that they can understand innocent people being bombed in uh, Manchester. It, it was a shocking thing to say. Shimina went on to talk about um, heads being in bins uh, and, and she wasn't phased. But we have to remember she was a 19-year-old girl. She was, 19, uh, she was nine months pregnant. Uh, she's lost three children. Would, would we have allowed a 19-year-old uh, who was nine months pregnant to, to be interviewed? And we have to remember the guards there were in control of absolutely everything that was happening there. Mm. Uh, and, and quite frankly, she's going to find it very, very difficult for the public to have, be sympathetic to her after having made that interview. It's going to be incredibly challenging. Let's go to um, Philip Ingram, who is a former senior British military intelligence officer. Um, there is clearly a potential security threat if Shamima Begum comes back to the UK. That is what the government is worried about. That's why they are not wanting to give her citizenship. The independent terrorism advisor just said there is also a security threat if they continue with people in these um, camps. She's currently in a camp in Syria, which he said you know, is a potential training ground for extremism. How do you think about the balance of risks? What would you advise the government to do? Well, I think the risk of her um, being re-radicalised in the Syrian camps is a risk then in Syria and where there is um, a, a continuing terrorist problem. The risk of her coming back here is a risk to the population of the UK. And it's the message that that sends out to other potential terrorists um, who um, could rally around the flag. You know, I think we've got a moral balance here, and um, uh, Bob brought it out um, perfectly well, um, in that you know, she made a mistake when she was 15. She's made another mistake when she was 19, that he's just said. Um, she, she's like a chameleon. She changes her story at every opportunity to see who will get, get some sympathy. If she's brought back here, um, we will have to spend a fortune in taxpayers' money potentially prosecuting her. If that fails... Um, or when she's released from prison, if she gets into prison, we'll have to spend a fortune monitoring her as a potential threat. And if we have to put physical observation behind her, which for some period of time we probably will, that will dilute the very overstretched assets that we've got trying to keep us safe at the moment and will cost the taxpayer you know, in excess of a million pounds a year. Now, I would far rather, in the moral dilemma, have that million pounds and the other millions that would go in legal cases go to pay our police a little bit more, to pay our nurses a little bit more, to pay our doctors a little bit more, to pay our teachers a little bit more, rather than being um, wasted on an individual who, yes, she's made bad choices, but she knew what she was doing. I mean, Jonathan, modern slavery laws to protect trafficking, because she's been claimed as a trafficker, does that mean that it's very hard for this appeal not to be found, that basically she ultimately will have to come back? Does that impact on things? 
Well, we'll have to see. I, I don't believe that she gave evidence. So I think that the government's position is going to be one, look, look at the facts. She didn't give evidence, so how could a court say that she has, in fact, been trafficked? And I suspect they'll be saying, um, well, you know, she's, she's adopting a convenient defence. You know, we'll have to see what the judge says about that. Um, I, I, it, it's a factual matter, really, rather than a legal matter. And it, it, in any event, I think the government will be pointing to the question of risk. Um, I mean, just addressing what, what Philip was saying there, I mean, he, he's really right. And, and I think there is a really strong point here that, you know, money will have to be spent on people who come back from Syria. On the other hand, nothing is completely cost free. And I mean, let's just imagine that all Europeans came back from the camps and the only country that kept their people in the camps were, were the British. You can very quickly imagine the sort of arguments, Britons, Guantanamo, etc., the UK already pays money to the Syrian Defence Force to guard the camps and contributes to, to those camps. So there is, there is a cost there, I think, of not acting. And Philip may be right. It may be right that at the moment it's best to keep people away because there's plenty of other threats to the system. There's a lot of hostile state activity at the moment. There are other terrorist threats. And he's completely right about the costs of monitoring. But I would also be a bit cautious about suggesting that the UK system can't absorb that sort of risk. I mean, so, we do have very good authorities, are very good at managing quite complex and challenging risks. So where we are, um, Philip has made it clear that he thinks she shouldn't return. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, I think you're saying that the courts have to decide, but you, on balance, would have her return. Yes, I think you're fair to ask me that question. I found this really hard, and I'm, I'm doing a detailed speech at the end of the oh, month where I set okay. out all the arguments. But I do think, on balance... Okay. We, the, the, the women and children in particular, and children's my real focus, mm. um, need to be brought back in a controlled way. Well, Do you think she'll come back or not? I, I think that the law will say that she will, she will come back. I think the difficulty uh, is going to be, what do you do with these people long-term? You've got mm. children there who have gone there. I mean, she was, she was you 15. you think she should come back? Well, she was, well, she was 15. We have to... The, the law will see, see where we are, but I, th I think it's very, very difficult to see how she will not have the opportunity to come back. I think that was a yes. No, no, it's, uh, I, I'm definitely saying yes. But right. I think, I think the, ch the key thing, uh, as Jonathan has said, children have gone in there and they're, thank they're the you. innocents. Um, Dar Babu, um, Philip Ingram, Jonathan Hall, thank you so much for joining us. Very important discussion. Big court case. We're going to hear the result about 10 o'clock this morning. That will not be the end of the story.